Hefe and I have been hiking down a steep canyon in what will hopefully be the, well, unfortunately, I guess, will be the last successful native cutthroat fly fishing trip in the mountains this season. And since most native cutthroat are in remote areas in the mountains that are really hard to get to, pretty much everything's going to get snowed in here in another day or so. So, Hefe's worn out. He's been running like a champ. You can see there's a gully here, all washed out from the snow that runs off all at once in our suddenly warm springs. So a very steep train. I just wanted to do, I don't know, a couple of pointers on this trip and stick them together. Hopefully this will help out when you get back into canyon country. Um, I've been walking this trail, super steep side hill as much as I can it's an old elk trail or game trail um, mostly elk but deer a lot and lions and whatnot roam this area too and I've been walking down this way so to the north actually the way you probably want to hold your rod is number one I just have it assembled without my line out and then I usually hang it behind me like so so I don't jam the tip into the ground or into a tree or something it's amazing how often your tip will just suddenly go right down to the ground. You snap it. You're in the middle of nowhere. And then you fish with willow sticks, I suppose. Um, so there. Tip in the back. I don't line up my reel, but I rig up the rod just because I don't feel like carrying the rod tube down into here. I'm trying to knock down every ounce I can. I have my layers here on the back. Can you see those? Yeah, there we go. I was trying to wear them on the way down, but man, I just got hot. It's... 43 degrees up on top. It's probably about the same down here, um, maybe 40. And it's November. It's just warm. Um, but I'm sweating like crazy. So, rod also, as you hold it, on the downhill side. That's where the ground shoots out below me. What this does, let's see if I can do a little example here. Let me do a little example. Just walking down the trail, just super slowly. I'm wearing hip boots as well, another little thing. Um, I just knew I was going to get hot, and it's kind of warm, and I didn't want chest waders to just make me even get hotter. And it's, it's actually kind of easier to hike and maintain your temperatures in uh, hip boots. And I know the water's not going to be super deep, so hip boots it is. I can layer a little bit better. I have access to my pockets. Um, it's just kind of nice. So... The reason you want to hold your rod on the downhill side here, because if you fall, instinctively, almost always, you're going to slip like this and go into the hillside and you're going to stick your hand out to catch yourself. If your rod is on the uphill side, you're going to snap your rod almost instantly and then you're going to cry. You just tears a go-go, which might be good. Maybe the tears will run down the steep hill and fill up the river. You will cry so much over the broken rod. To prevent that, uh, I actually learned this training to fight fires for the Forest Service years ago. Um, you hold your, your Pulaski's and your shovels and whatnot on the downhill side. And that's where I got to thinking about it, was thinking back to my fire training. And so now as a fly angler, or at, when I'm hunting in the same country, I'll try to hold my firearm or my rod on the downhill side so that when inevitably I slip and fall, it's like this. And again, I have it felt bottom boots. Not the best for hiking in this country. It's really slick. You want to be mindful of any sticks that are downhill. Like almost everything will end up like this. And that's just a, a shoot. If you step on that, it'll take your feet out from underneath you. So try to find across the grain or across the canyon stuff to prop yourself up on when you fall inevitably. Um, and just wedge that top part of your boot into the whatever you can for the dirt. Like, Keep your weight uphill and kind of pound your foot down when you step just to get any. Thanks, Hefe. Just to get any part of your heel into the ground for any little bit of traction you can get. So I'm nearing the river now. I'm finally most of the way down the canyon. A little over three quarters of the way. You can see the elk trails, they kind of go all over the place. There's some magnificent old growth fir and spruce trees in here it's just untamed untrammeled country 
because if it were anything but, we would have destroyed it and cutthroat wouldn't survive. So this has been about my pace. I've been hiking almost strictly downhill for about 40 minutes. Yeah, hiking for a half hour. But see, I'm also switchbacking a lot. And you can see, I mean, there's game trails doing the same thing. Switchback, switchback. Um, the animals kind of do the same thing. Go side to side and they're not as determined to get to any place over another, but if you just keep going, I'm also trying to stay away from snow. So I'm scouting out like no snow there, snow there where Hefe is. So actually I should go that way, but there's a pool that's pretty deep over there that I saw a little while ago and I want to fish it. I don't want to walk on top of it. So I'm going to go against what I've been doing and walk through the snow here down a little washout that was very likely a game trail but it's washed out all the litter so anyways there's a tip or two on canyon hiking oh you can see the water now really well Woo see how clear it is every fish in there is gonna know I'm there if I'm not careful with my approach so let's talk about our approach on ultra clear ultra low canyon water with genetically pure native Yellowstone cutthroat trout and how to yell at your brown dog that'll probably spook them all for you it'll be fun hope you enjoy all right made it down wasn't easy I actually got up to over there we can't really see through the trees and then you see those cliffs. I was right above those. Um, I guess I could have gotten down on that point, but I couldn't see that point. So I walked uphill because I could see a little bit of a low spot. Actually, Hefe came down over here somewhere. So I just followed Hefe. And I believe he came down using this little step. And that's my low spot to get down the canyon is that really steep spot. He comes out in this bench. And then, boom, right to that super clear Beautiful, pure water that hold pure cutthroat. Oh man, hands aren't working. Um, I got one other little pointer. I don't, it's not super critical, but my hat's turned backwards. Uh, and it's not because I'm trying to be cool. I'm very bad at being cool, but I do that to reduce heat. If your brim's around sticking out over your forehead, you'll get warmer, I guarantee you, and your glasses if you're wearing them will generally fog up even if they're anti-fog lenses uh, when you're exerting yourself going in and out of canyons um, everything fogs up so to cool down and reduce fog uh, enable me to be able to take in the beautiful nature of nature I turn my hat backwards until I cool down which will happen soon and then I have a stocking cap to put over top of my trucker cap and oh man cool look at that little bench we were getting to a snowstorm, I could hang out there and be a cave person for a bit. I'd love it. My wife would get mad, but I would love it. Anyways, just a cool little creek. Lots of different elevations. This is pretty flat now, not the best holding water, but when the water is high at runoff, this is all one nice pool. And the fish use it a lot. I mean, this is what they use for the most part. So, a lot of room, even this little narrow canyon canyon's been wearing out the walls for years there's a little bit of a pool i'm just going to kind of walk through it i'll probably spook something i'm not too concerned about it no, actually i don't see anything in there um you know look it's just kind of ankle shin deep deep water is going to be needy this time of the year easy to do in hip boots oh man and his midge is out i don't know if you can see him on the screen but size 22 midge so like, oh i can see a fish in the water right there uh there's no way to show you with the camera just because it's well not real big and a ways away but so i see a fish i see midges adults so if I found something probably it'll look like a midge larva to fool these trout on oh, there's a really nice pool right here so we'll get to that in just a minute 
All right, so I was talking about the low clear water a little while ago, and I'll have to be really careful about approaching the river. So I put on this little fly, a little, I don't know, almost a pink tag, only it doesn't have a tag, just a little like waltz worm kind of with a soft tackle. And that's a 2.4 millimeter bead, little. And I have four, uh, 5X tippet on. And I just drifted it through this pool, which I've been looking at from above, standing up above. And I didn't catch anything. And I was like, oh, that's weird. There's no fish in here. Because <laughs> I didn't catch any. You'd think that would happen. Well, so I cross here where this little spot goes around that little, you can see the rose hips there, a little rose bush. Just upstream in that riffle. Half and I walked across. And as soon as I stepped down in the water, and actually, as soon as I walked up on the shoulder, I saw, hefe, come like eight fish that were no smaller than 11 inches and one that must be in the low teens. Very big fish for really not the biggest pool in the world with a very small deep spot and in just a really small stream. But those are big fish for this stream. Uh, anything a foot long is rather a monster in here. Uh, and some get bigger. There's one in there, it's bigger and it's lighter colored. It's kind of interesting. So I just stood here and then I walked downstream like this, like just sort of moving my feet this fast to not spook them. And I it wasn't even five minutes later, I can see them again. They're kind of hanging out the tail. They were all down in the tail of the pool. They weren't in the middle where the deepest spot is. Now they worked their way down to about the very, right where it ramps up, right where the riffle or the run kind of starts at the downstream edge of that deep spot of the pool. Let me see if I can flip my lens around and get you a look. Okay, that's the pool. Can't really see much without polarizers, right? And with the polarizers, what are we looking at? I think you can see the little gray shapes in there facing upstream. You can see their tails and their sides every once in a while. They just look gray. I'm trying to turn my lens different ways to see if it helps. So anyways, I'm going to probably stop my camera because I kind of need do I need both hands to do this? Oh, this is what I did. I forgot to tell you this part. Um, well, yeah, I went to this bigger pink tag fly with a 3.3 millimeter copper bead. Faster, I'm just doing a single bead and we will see if that's gonna get down deep enough. I was getting down maybe eight inches before and I didn't even get a look. Oops, dropped one of my flies. So, I got a heavier bead, it's fast water, it's probably deeper than it looks. Clear water can be a tease, you think it's shallow, but it's really deep sometimes. Uh, see if I can fish one-handed and still, all right, up above most of the fish. Oh no, there's the, there we go. just touch the bottom near where the fish are. I almost think the fish are swimming out of the way of my fly. Uh, so that's a disappointment. You see that little stick getting in the way too. But the fish haven't spooked. They're still in there. They don't like the pink tag. And these are, I bet these fish haven't been fished for since July when I was up here last. Might have been late June. And I'm not sure I got down this far. I don't think I did. Not on that trip. But they're being picky. Mouths are staying kind of closed and they're literally, oops. Oh, I got a snag anyways. I'm probably gonna have to break this off probably just spooked all the fish but no they're still there crazy all right i'm gonna switch stuff around hopefully get that snag out and uh, we'll get back to it all right i fooled one finally i switched to oh i switched to a different fly a darker one and i think this is that bigger 
light colored fish that I was talking about. It was actually, Effie, get your head out of the way. Up above in the faster water, kind of underneath that, those overhanging willows. Beautiful. Little spots, the cheek patches, the par marks. I mean, oh, you just are hard pressed to find a more beautiful fish able to survive in just rough country. There she goes. Yeah, that was one of the bigger ones. Weird though, I uh, I cast into that pool with this fly. I went to a black one. And I've been doing a lot more black than I have gray lately. I don't know why, maybe it's just the water I'm in. There's a lot of stoneflies and there's a lot of drake, mayflies too. I feel that has, a, oh, and then case caddis, which usually have a dark case. So I think a lot of reason to fish darker and that was all I did. But the fish still, they didn't move out of the way, but they didn't take it down at the tail out where the water is a little more clear. I got one cast up into that fast water, which right where it drops off and right before it went up underneath those willow branches and hooked up with a, just a tremendous native cutthroat. Been here since the last ice age, the genes in this stream. All right, so I'm gonna continue with the dark orange tag and uh, as black CDC mix kind of everything, dubbing body, orange, glow bright ribbing in I think a 3.3 tungsten bead on the Hardy Ultralight LL 08, 02, 10 foot eight inch rod. Seems like kind of a big rod for a small stream. However, I was standing about 18 feet off the bank and was only able to kind of reach around the willows and get in line with the thaw leg, the deepest part of the stream by reaching out with a long rod. Um, I could have made casts with normal quote unquote rods, but it would have been more difficult and I would have slapped a lot more line on the water um, and very likely spooked more fish. This way I can just put a little bit of line on there and really not make much of a splash with my presentation, which is helpful and not spooking these fish. These are very wild, well, I mean, they're native fish. They really don't see much for fishing pressure at all. This is not an easy canyon to get into. It's a very small stream. Um, it's just not much pressure here. All right, I'm gonna work downstream to that amazing little spot. <laughs> Go see what happens there. Oh man, big old caddis. Oh, size 12. Okay, another beautiful native cutty and just a beautiful, look at that. Just good, good proportionate size. I mean, not really fat, but it's a granitic uh, geology here. A little brighter than the last one, right? Look at those orange, pink side or orange sides, cheeks, orange cheeks. Still those bluish par marks on the side. Huge round spots, concentrated towards the tail. Classic Yellowstone cutthroat trout. And it took that black. Um, I don't even know what to call it. Black orange tag, I guess. Survival, and look at this pool. This is this one got me excited. You can see this is a lot more of a, say a classic pool, a really narrow entrance where the boulders come in. And as I was fighting this fish, a rock fell off the wall right in this stream. Gotta be careful for falling rocks. Hey, hey come here. Um, little tail out here, you know, slow water over there, nice little side pocket. Up in there, I'm guessing there's gonna be some of the better fish. So that's gonna be difficult to get to, overhanging branches and all, but I'll get in there eventually. It'll be fun. Okay, here, I downsized. Hefe, big hole. That's kind of right up above Hefe, it was about where all the fish were. Another beautiful. 
not fat, not skinny. Well, kind of skinny. Genetically pure, native, Yellowstone cutthroat. I can't get over that fact. I just, they've been here so long. I mean, 10, 12, 15,000 years, as far as anyone knows, surviving in this little tiny stream. Big old spots. And um, they're not half as easy to catch as you might think. It, part of me thinks it's probably their biology is slowing down. Uh, the water's cold. And I mean, it's early November. So they're maybe just setting up a colder, um, they're in a colder region, so they're slowing down. They're cold-blooded, right? So they're a little bit trickier to fool. That one took, so another kind of a variation on a tag. It's a red flash tag with purple, purple uh, squirrel fur, and then what I put on there, an orange collar, red wire rib. And that one got them. That's about a size 16, I think. And that one's been, it's been good in other rivers too. That one, that was only a few casts in and it took it. So downsized a bit, darkened the flies a bit, and we're gonna work upstream. Got another one. Fell for the same dark purple squirrel tail, red tag fly. Beautiful. Once again, native. So there we go. I mean, I know I talked about the midges. Um, this isn't too far from representing. <laughs> there it goes. And this is just another pool up above that has that overhanging alder. I think that's an alder. Um, I just kind of dropped it in between the branches, let it drift down, and it took, um, and, you know, not necessarily the farthest thing from a midge pupa dark relatively little a little bit of flash so i've had pretty good luck with this and that's kind of all i'm going to show you today beautiful stream beautiful area i hope you're able to find preserve take care of some similar place in your own neck of the woods with native trout and hope you're enjoying it soon these places are really rare. We have to really, really work to keep water flowing through these things so that fish can survive at all, let alone the natives. Be gentle.